Okay, so it is now 12.35. I should actually change my clock here. Let's see here, I am recording, so that's all good. You guys can hear me, so that's nice too, I guess. Um, so uh, today we are gonna talk a little bit about the Ramsey model, which I put the new videos uh, for it online and I have a little plan here. So let me quickly share this. Um, so the basic plan for the day, I think is, oh, I wanted to talk about something. I read something that is a bit related to our discussion about um, macroeconomics and what makes something macroeconomics versus microeconomics. So I wanted to talk about that first. It's sort of an aside. Um, and then we'll do the Kahoot. And then after that, we'll do a question and answer about the Ramsey model. Uh, and then finally, we'll start going through part of problem set one at a, you know, a relaxed pace. We don't have to get through all of it today. We can just do part of it. Um, so yeah, that's the plan. 
Uh, before I begin, are there any questions about the plan? Okay. If not, then I guess the first thing I wanted to mention was I'm reading this uh, this book. Let me find it. Yeah. Ah. Uh, which you probably can't even see, but it's called um, Money and Government, and it's by uh, Robert Skidelsky, um, who's this like heterodox guy, right? So I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's like so the subtitle of this book is a challenge to mainstream economics. Okay, so this guy is sort of outside of the mainstream, if you like, of, of macroeconomics. And I thought it'd be interesting to sort of read what some of these guys think, since I think what I teach here is very well in the mainstream of macroeconomics. And, uh, and first of all, I, I'll say that the book could have used some major editing. I think that the first warning should have been the blurb on the front that says, likely to be the most valuable economics book that you read this year. And I was thinking to myself, this is like, I think it's 2018, but the, like the best blurb they could get was likely to be the most valuable economics book that you read this year. <laughs> like think about the number of qualifications there. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah. So he makes a point though. He makes, uh, there's a couple of interesting points in the, that he makes. So let me just make one of them here. So you may have seen this equation before in your macro 101 course. Let's see here, it goes like this usually C and then there's usually a Y minus T here plus let's do the simplest version I plus well now let's see let's just put that in plus G plus NX. So you will remember that this is uh, an equation where in like macro 101, you usually derive the money or the, uh, the multiplier. Okay, so like the fiscal multiplier, if the government increases its spending, then that's going to increase production. Okay, and then since if more stuff is produced, that's somebody's income, right? If the government is spending money on something that's produced, that's somebody's income. And then here, the uh, the income is going to go into the consumption function, and then there's going to be more consumption demanded, which is going to create in, increase the amount of output again. And then, you know, the output is somebody's income, and then that kind of goes back and forth. And then you end up with a multiplier. If you recall from your macro 101 course, the multiplier is typically one minus, like, marginal propensity of consumption is the multiplier. Multiplier. Okay, so I actually, I think I might've mentioned that I have been teaching this course for many years now, I think it's my fourth or fifth time. Um, but I actually had never taught macro 101 and I actually didn't, my undergraduate was in political science. So I never actually even had macro 101. I only had master's macro and PhD macro. Um, so um, I never actually really studied this before. Um, and it sort of, studying this made me realize some things about um, why we study the topics we study in macro. So. Here's one way of thinking about this equation. Now, the way that I have always kind of thought about it is a much more simple way, I think. So the way I think about this is as an accounting identity, okay? So we have output here, okay? And then how can we use our output? We can use our output, we can consume it, we can invest it, the government might consume it, okay? Or alternatively, we can send it abroad. Okay, so that's kind of like, how can you split up your output? Okay, and then how do we know how much output we have? Well, the output is based on things like how many workers do we have in our economy? You know, how many machines and buildings? How much capital do we have in our economy? So the idea is kind of that this left-hand side here is fixed. And then what people can decide over is what's here on the right-hand side. 
Um, so you can see that this is a very different way of thinking about this equation. This is how I've always thought about it until this macro course I taught um, earlier this year. So the reason I'm mentioning it is um, there's this phenomenon or there's this topic that is often taught in, in like a master's macro course, um, which is called the, oh, I'm losing it here. Um, oh, it's like consumption smoothing, okay. consumption smoothing. Oh, I, actually, rather than that, I'm going to call it the permanent income hypothesis. Perma, uh oh, nent, nent, my spelling is terrible. That's ant. Oops. No, it's ant. <laughs> I think it's ant. I'm, I'm in a generation that's late enough. I'm, I'm actually an elder millennial. I was born in 1981, and some people make the cutoff for millennials 1980. So it's, I get a pass here on my spelling. But anyway, permanent income hypothesis. All right, um, and this has something to do with consumption smoothing. Consumption smoothing. So I've always found this topic kind of immediate and sort of uninteresting. So um, the idea here is that suppose, it seems kind of obvious. So suppose that you were to get a big windfall of income for some reason. So suppose you go, you decide to pay the, uh, the what some people call the stupid tax and buy a lottery ticket. Um, the, um, uh, and, you, and you win. Okay, so suppose you win and, um, and you get this windfall of income. Now the question is, will you spend all of it immediately or will you sort of smooth out your spending um, over time? Okay, so this hypothesis says that you will smooth out this sort of spending over time. You know, you don't want to spend it all today because, uh, you know, the basic idea is that there's marginal utility. You, know, you have a utility function. Here's your consumption. Here's your utility. It's it's curved. It's concave. So your marginal utility is decreasing. So you'd rather have several days of lower consumption rather than one day of very high consumption, other days of low consumption. Okay. So that's kind of the idea. Um, you can also see it, we're going to study later something called the Euler equation, which you can write like this. So let's suppose we have two periods, let's call it T and T plus one. Then by the Euler equation, we want to have, here I'm going to be a bit informal, let's say we have like a discount factor, and then we have an interest rate here, U prime of C T plus one. If, if households are making decisions, you're going to get some sort of equation like this. And we'll talk about these quite a bit later, called the Euler equation. And basically what this says is that you don't want your consumption to be very, very high in one period and very, very low in another period. You want your marginal utilities to be close to the same, only sort of mediated by the difference between the rate of return and, the, and how much you prefer to consume earlier rather than later. Okay. So anyway, the whole point is that people smooth their consumption. And um, in fact, if you look at the textbook, so here's the textbook for this course, which you can't see because of the zoom filter, but um, there's actually a chapter. And when I took this course over for the first time a few years ago, um, my, uh, the person who was teaching the course previous to me actually had a, a lecture, like a, one of the subjects that he covered was chapter eight, which is called consumption. And really that is, about this permanent income hypothesis. The way he actually did the course was that that was like the first subject he covered. Um, he did consumption investment and then he went into growth and the business cycle, what we're gonna do. So I, I did that the first year and then I just kind of like, you know, this is kind of boring. It's like this consumption thing. Of course people smooth their consumption and then you know it goes into how can you test for this hypothesis and then some like papers that tested for it. So um, I think that this is one of those situations where you know, there's this fiery academic debate and then one side sort of just wins. And then all we see afterwards is just the ashes of that heated debate. Um, and this permanent income hypothesis that I've always found sort of not very interesting. I think it's the ashes of a debate that was 
very fiery exactly about these this these two models I've, I've written down here. So this model up here, this what you've experienced in Macro 101, that's kind of a Keynesian model, Keynesian model of macro, uh, Keynesian macro. So the idea here is that, you know, there's some slack, right? There's some people that are unemployed. So if the government spends, then those unemployed people then can sort of enter into the economy and start producing. And that's gonna have this sort of chain reaction, right? Down here, this is what is sometimes called new classical, new classical macro or classical in an unintelligible way, classical, new classical macro. And, um, and that has this idea that, you know, if there's no frictions, then the only unemployment is sort of frictional unemployment. You know, the unemployment in the sense that it takes time for workers to find uh, employers and employers to find workers. So there's always going to be a bit of sort of frictional unemployment, um, but sort of all the factors are being used as much as they can be. Um, and it was this debate that sort of this permanent income stuff was sort of mediating this debate. So check out this Keynesian macro equation here. So what this says is that if the government spends, that enters into people's incomes, and then they sort of increase their consumption immediately, right? Um, based on some multiplier here, or it's based on some marginal propensity to consume. What this permanent income hypothesis really says is that if people get a windfall of money, but it's only a one-time windfall, they're going to, they will increase their consumption a bit, but it's going to be very, very, very tiny because they want to cons they want to spread that consumption out across a long period of time. So in other words, this permanent income hypothesis, which is famous as the guy who's behind it is Milton Friedman, who's a famous sort of new classical uh, sort of opponent of Keynesian macro. He's really like firing a shot at the Keynesians and saying, you know, your model here doesn't make sense because this MPC is very, very close to zero. There's almost no multiplier at all. So, uh, so yeah, I, and I never realized that until I read this book because one of the things that this money in government, this sort of heterodox economist does, he really likes Keynesianism much more than sort of do classical. Can I ask a question about that? Sure, go ahead. Um, because what you're describing right now uh, kind of means that a lot of the policies that we've seen implemented throughout the corona crisis would be like null and void or useless because the US, I think, gave a one-time payment or at least promised at that time one-time payment of $1,200. I think they're doing it again. And in Denmark, they also gave us a one-time payment of like all of your vacation saved money. You can get that back, but you can't like, you know, spread it out. And the idea behind that, as far as I could understand, we're both motivated to boost consumption, like in the short term. So doesn't that mean that at the very least, it's somewhere in between the two theories because there is some degree of consumption smoothing that people assumed, but like it's nowhere near as aggressive as you would assume, right? Well, I mean, that's a good question. And I think that you'll actually hear a debate about this, right? So, I mean, even right now, actually, there is an ongoing debate in the United States, at least I know, about, um, about whether this stimulus package is, this very large stimulus package is a good idea. And it's very close to along these lines of debate. So I think that some people, some sort of conservative, more sort of uh, new classical style economists in the in the uh, in the tradition of, of say Milton Friedman say that's just going to cause inflation, and it's not really going to you know the money isn't really going to have much of an effect at all. There's another kind of economist now kind of known as a new Keynesian, okay, and they're the they're the ones who say that these. Uh, these stimuluses are going to have an effect. Okay. So this, I mean, in a sense, we've sort of moved on from this debate between Keynesian macro and new classical economics. These guys lost. Okay. I mean, outside of macro 101, you just don't see this model. Um, it's funny because this ISLM model is really in the back. If you listen to like macro commentary by like non-academic macroeconomists on TV, 
um, you know, just like TV personalities, they often have this sort of very simple ISLM model in the back of their head. But um, these days now there's sort of, there's an, a third thing here called new Keynesian models of macroeconomics. And uh, we're actually gonna study some of the new Keynesian models in this course. So for these, it's they don't use this argument that people are sort of short-sighted and when they get a windfall of money, then they go out and, and, um, and spend it uh, because of some marginal propensity to consume. Rather, it, it's a very similar argument actually. They, they say that prices are sticky in the short run. So firms, for one reason or another, we're gonna look at two models that have this feature. Um, they can't change their prices in the short run, in the short term. So, um, so basically when there's like a productivity shock, then um, it's gonna, it's gonna have this sort of, it's gonna have this sort of effect in it, but in sort of a more sophisticated way, I guess. Um, yeah, I think the, I think the big, the thing that kind of defeated this Keynesian macro, the reason why nobody, it's very little sort of academic research at least, or, or um, academic macroeconomic research takes place in this sort of Keynesian macro is that people don't like this function. This is an aggregate consumption function. There's no um, choice here. Um, so in the new Keynesian models, there's a similar flavor to the old Keynesian models but now rather than having an aggregate consumption function, you have individuals that are making decisions in sort of an optimal way, like say, according to this thing, um, but now some of the prices are sticky. So you end up with sort of a similar flavor, but it's sort of a slightly different mechanism, but yeah. So um, there's still a debate though. So, I mean, new classical sort of RBC type, we're gonna talk about that RBC models of the business cycle. Lots of people are still, you know, there's lots of sort of more conservative economists that uh, that don't believe that the stimulus stuff is a good idea. And then there's a lot of New Keynesian macroeconomists that think that it's good. So that's that's the lines of the debate right now, I think. So yeah, anyway, I thought this was interesting because I, uh, you know, I had learned about this stuff and I always thought it was kind of boring. And then now I learned that the reason, the whole point of it was that it was a critique of the original sort of conception of Keynesian macro. And, uh, you know, it's, we don't see that, we don't see that debate. We just see the remnants of the debate, which is sort of interesting, I thought. So that was kind of neither here nor there, but any questions about that before I, uh, I move on? Okay, so the next thing on my list, let's see, a 35, yeah. Next thing on my list is the Kahoot. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and reshare because I know that I need to share with um, sound. Alrighty. Okay, do you guys see the Kahoot? I'll just see if you guys start joining. By the way, um, so you suggested last time that we should, uh, I should give you more time. So now each question has 30 seconds. We'll see how that works. Oh, we got crude man again. Leroy Jenkins. Benim. We have a Turk in the class.
28. We have 28 people in the course. Listening right and on the course, but listening at the moment. 21 people joined. We got seven others. I'll give you a couple minutes. Uh, I'll give you a couple seconds, I guess. Which is not a direct cause of economic growth? I thought we only had 22 people. Okay, so um, as just to say some one thing about this here, I agree with the class. So um, we, we can write out a production function. Typically, it's going to look like this in this course. Okay, so what gives us more output? Well, more capital. It's more machines, right? More people, or better ideas. Okay, so these sort of directly increase the size of the economy, if you like. Moving on. All right, which part of economic growth does the solo model focus on? Capital accumulation, population growth, productivity increases, or infrastructure improvements? You don't, <laughs> I don't think you lose points for answering, so you can always guess. Um, yeah, so uh, let's see here. Um, so we had two answers that, uh, two sort of answers that got votes. So one is capital accumulation and one is productivity increases. I can see why you might answer productivity increases. One of the results of the solo growth model is that growth in the long run is only the economy grows at the rate of productivity increases. But, you know, the reason that the correct answer here is capital accumulation, or maybe I should say the most correct answer, um, is that, you know, technological growth in these models is just exogenous. It's something that we assume. Um, so it's uh, sort of not the interesting part of the model. The interesting part here is how savings get turned into capital and how, you know, growth rates change along the transition path from one, uh, from sort of an initial capital stock to, uh, to your long run uh, steady state. So that's why capital accumulation, I think is the best answer here, but I can see some logic here behind productivity increases. So. Okay. I should also mention that later we're going to look at uh, a growth model called the endogenous growth model that's gonna focus on technology and uh, innovation. Um, so you, of course you haven't seen that yet, but relative to that model, then this model is certainly more focused on capital accumulation. Which part of economic growth does the Ramsey growth model focus on? Infrastructure improvement, productivity growth, population increase or capital accumulation? Okay. 
A. Uh, yes, exactly. So it's exactly the same, really. I mean, the only thing that, well, I'm not going to say more because it's actually going to be the next question, but uh, using the same argument I just used uh, for the solar growth model, you're going to get the same, uh, the same answer. What is the important difference between solo and Ramsey growth models? Of course, important, right? But uh, Ramsey is more complicated. Solo includes capital depreciation. Ramsey models individual choice, or Ramsey uses a phase diagram. These are all differences between the two models, by the way. Interesting. Okay, so um, so there were two popular answers here. Now, again, all of these things are true, right? So, I mean, the Ramsey model is more complicated. The solo model we studied does include capital appreciation, and the Ramsey model doesn't. The Ramsey model does model individual choice. Solo doesn't. And Ramsey does use a phase diagram. That's like the arrow is going in different directions. Um, so um, the best answer here is, in my opinion, is that Ramsey models individual choice. We could very easily put depreciation into the Ramsey model. It's, it was just to sort of make the model a tiny bit simpler um, that it's not there. It doesn't actually change anything important uh, if we put it in to the Ramsey model. So really like the important difference, the fundamental difference between the Ramsey growth model and the solo growth model is that the savings rate in the Ramsey growth model is going to change as the capital stock changes. Um, and that's because people are going to react to changes in the rate of return on capital. Um, so this is a little bit going back to what we were talking about um, with the old Keynesian models versus the new Keynesian models or the old Keynesian models versus the new classical models. So around in around the 1970s, I'm going to talk about this again, but um, you know, there was this Phillips curve. Um, this Phillips curve, which uh, can, there's different ways to write it, but uh, maybe the most famous way to write it is uh, a relationship between inflation so we'll call inflation pi and unemployment. And, you know, basically the government maybe or the society thinks that high inflation is bad and high unemployment is bad. And it turns out that there's sort of a statistical relationship that says that you can kind of choose. So if you look at like year by year, what is the inflation rate versus the unemployment rate from like 1900 until 1960 or 1970, then you're going to see that it's all kind of along this, like a line like this, looks like that, if, if each dot is a year. So um, macroeconomists sort of had thought that this relationship was just a permanent statistical relationship between these two variables. So what's the job of, say, the central bank? It's to sort of choose, you know, do you want to have a little higher inflation and a little lower unemployment, or maybe a little higher unemployment and lower inflation? You just make a choice. But what happened is in the 1970s, um, they got dots out here. So like 1977, 1975 would be like out here somewhere with both high unemployment and also high inflation. So the way that sort of the profession reacted to this was to say, you know, we can't model things like aggregate consumption functions. We need, we need to, or aggregate, um, uh, we have to we have to look more at individual choices because you know people's preferences don't change even when policies change or shocks happen people's preferences don't change these statistical relationships can change but people's preferences don't change so we should model people's individual choices and then think about when we change policy how is uh, how is that policy going to change when people's individual choices change so why am I talking about this? You can see why there was this solo growth model first, where you just sort of assumed a savings rate. And then after this sort of breakdown of the Phillips curve and what's called the rational expectations revolution in the 1970s, then people said, you know, this isn't good enough. This doesn't make sense. So we really need to let people choose 
their savings rate. Um, and then let's see if the predictions of the models still hold. So you can kind of see this Ramsey growth model or this neoclassical growth model as, um, as a reaction to that rational expectations revolution. Okay, so that's why that's the most, that's why the individual choice is the most important part. Rid of my Phillips curve. Okay, okay. In solo, does an increase in the savings rate lead to an increase in equilibrium production? Okay, now I'm not gonna say anything about this until the next, after the next question. In solo, does an increase in the savings rate lead to an increase in the equilibrium consumption? Okay, we got some controversy here. For the first time, uh, I've uh, I've got one where the most popular answer wasn't the correct one. Okay, so you guys will recall, oops, let's draw it again. That sort of the graph we used to talk about the steady state in the solar growth model it looks like this. This is the break even. Okay, I should write what the axes are. So here's uh, capital per unit of human capital, physical capital per unit of human capital. And here's output per unit of human capital. Okay. And then this is the break even investment rate. So this says, how much do I have to invest in order to um, have the same level of K in the next period? So if I start here, how much do I have to invest so that I, I remain here in the next period? It's this level of investment. All right. Okay. And then there's two other things here. One of them is this one. So this might be S times little y. So here's our investment, our actual investment. Um, and then we have like a big one up here. And that's our output. Okay, so SY is a fraction of Y, right? S is the savings rate. Okay, so how does this graph work again? So you'll recall this is gonna be the steady state. So this is like our little K star. And if we're over here, you can see that our actual investment is greater than break-even investment. So it means that we're sort of moving this direction along this line. And over here, you can see that our actual investment is less than our break-even investment. So we're moving this direction along this line. Okay. So now we can think about these steady states. Okay. So I say equilibrium here, I mean steady state equilibrium. So if S increases, let's change our color here. S increases, then you can see, uh, that was my best attempt. So S prime here is greater than S. You can see that we're gonna get a higher amount of capital per unit of uh, human capital, and also a higher amount of production per unit of human capital, okay? So our steady state here, production, is higher unambiguously if we raise the savings rate. Okay, so that's the answer to the first question we asked, right? What happens to equilibrium production or steady state production um, if we raise the steady, steady state, uh, raise the savings rate <laughs> in steady state? Um, you can see that you're always gonna get more. It's always gonna go up, okay? That's unambiguous, okay? The second question is what happens to consumption? Okay, now I'm gonna use a different picture to talk about this one. You can also, you can see the, the consumption in this picture is actually your output minus investment. So I could talk about it on this picture. In fact, I'll, I'll just say one thing about this. Imagine that we raise this S, let's keep raising it until it gets close to one. Okay, that means that if we do that, let me draw one more line here then, let's draw it in green. 
let's get this S very close to one. Let's just say it's just a, share, a shade less than one. So it looks like that. Okay, so here's our S double prime Y. Whereas S double prime is now very close to one. Okay. Our, um, our you know, you can't see where the equilibrium is. It's maybe it's over here somewhere. But the consumption is going to be output minus investment. So your consumption is only going to be this tiny little bit here if this is our uh, savings rate. Okay, down here on the red line, consumption is going to be this whole amount. You can see it's much more. So when you raise the savings rate, we're actually reducing consumption in this case. Um, but now I've got too many lines here, so I'm just going to draw a new graph. Start with blue. Um, we could draw consumption here as a function of the savings rate. It goes up to one, starts at zero. It's going to look something like this. Okay. This looks like delta. It's supposed to be an S. Okay, and why is that? Well, uh, again, if we're saving everything, of course we have no consumption. Okay, if we save nothing. Well, then we have a lot of consumption along the transition path, but since we're not saving anything, our capital is depreciating away in the solar model, right? There's depreciation. So our capital is depreciating away. Eventually we have no capital. If we have no capital, we have no production. Okay. So we have no consumption. We have no capital, no production, no consumption in steady state. And that is the steady state. So what this says is we have a zero amount of consumption when savings rate is zero we have a zero amount of consumption when savings rate is one, and we have positive consumption when savings rate is in the middle. Okay, so does consumption increase or decrease if we increase the savings rate? Well, it depends where we start, right? If we start here, then when we increase the savings rate, our steady state consumption goes up, right? It goes from here to here. If we start over here, then our steady state consumption is going down. So whether or not consumption rises or falls when we increase the savings rate depends on where we start. Okay, so the correct answer here is that it's indeterminate, the answer to this one. Stop me, of course, if you guys have any questions. Okay. <clears throat> no production growth, no population growth. According to these models, what is growth in the, uh, does, is there growth in the long run? If there's no production, gr productivity growth, if there's no population growth, is there growth in the long run? In Ramsey and Solo, it's the same answer. I, was, I probably said production growth. Pro no productivity growth, no population growth. Okay, no is the correct answer. And the reason why is you'll recall that we solve for a steady state in both of these models. Both of the models is, are going to approach a steady state where little k, oops. We're gonna approach a steady state where little k is constant. Okay, and remember that little k is big K divided by AL. Okay, so if there's no product, uh, productivity growth, it means A is not changing. If there's no population growth, it means L is not changing. Okay, since little k is not changing, it must also mean that big K is not changing. Okay, so it means that in steady state, there is no growth uh, of the economy. K and AL are staying the same. Remember, our output is output is this thing. Okay, these guys aren't changing. This isn't changing. This thing isn't changing. There's no economic growth. Okay. Another way to think about it is we said that the economy grows, the output grows at the growth rate of technology plus the growth rate of population. Right? Our growth rate. Our growth rate of output in the economy was yeah, 
GA plus GM. Uh, so yeah. Imagine that every building in the world is destroyed in a giant earthquake. According to these models, what do we expect to happen to the growth rate of these economies? Okay, so most people wrote rise. I can see how you could be a bit tricky here. So what I meant, what I meant to say here is imagine that we're on a steady state. Okay. So according to these models, we're on a steady state here. Right. Already you could dispute me because I didn't say that, assume that we're on a steady state. Okay. And then every building in the world is destroyed. That means that our new capital level is going to be over here. Okay. So uh, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to get quicker growth, right? Because we're actually moving along this line. So every year we're actually getting sort of more capital relative to what we would at steady state because we're, we have to kind of make it back to steady state. Okay, so we're actually going to experience quicker growth along the transition. If we were to sort of- Yes. We have a drop in production, right? Yes, of course you have a drop in production. Yeah, that's what tricked me here. Okay. Right, exactly. So um, in fact, let me just continue drawing this picture because I think that it's going to make exactly this point. Uh, suppose that we look at uh, Y is a bad example. Let's, let's make big Y output, okay? So big Y is growing here before this terrible disaster. And then what happens is that there's this terrible shock at this point. We have a big drop in production, but then we're gonna have this. Yeah, maybe it's gonna look more like this actually. Return, something like that. Okay, so this is time and this is production. So we have this big drop here, a big drop in, in the level of output but then we're gonna get faster growth along this transition path until we get back to a steady state. Keep that in mind, because I think there's gonna be a couple questions that are like that coming up. Any other questions about that? So if there are some, some people died during the earthquake, what will happen instead? If some people died during the earthquake, okay. So uh, if we focus here on this Y, I suspect that's going to drop down here too. Um, I think what's, what's going to happen is we're still going to get quicker growth. Well, yeah, we're still going to get quicker growth, I think. Um, do, do we assume that the population growth rate returns to its long run level? Like we don't change the population growth rate. We just change the level of population. If so, I think we're still going to return to the same uh, slope but um, it might be a little bit lower than it would have otherwise been. So in that situation, maybe we would have like, you know, this, something like that. Uh, wouldn't that depend on the relative change in, in population versus buildings? So like I, don't, I don't think so because the, um, because in the long run, the, um, the growth rate of the economy in these models is going to be GA plus GN. So, you know, that's going to kind of give you the slope of this line. So um, you might change the level, but I don't think you're going to change the slope unless you change the growth rates. Is my intuition. No, but I mean, like, if sufficiently, if a sufficient amount of people dies, then the capital intensity after the earthquake would be closer to the equilibrium already. But like, if, okay, if every, if all capital is gone, then I guess it doesn't matter. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, interesting. Yeah, because I was thinking about the same. I think if like we don't destroy the, oil, the buildings, but just people die, we actually have like less growth in the beginning because we our capital is too high. And then we get to a parallel line on a lower level, I would say. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, that sounds, that sounds right, actually. And, um, and, um, and what I guess what you're saying is suppose that every building in the world were destroyed in a giant earthquake and proportionally almost every person was also destroyed in this earthquake, then we could actually be immediately on the steady state or we could be higher or we could be lower. So I agree with that. So um, I think that maybe I should have also written in this question, all else equal, which you'll see is my go-to way to say, we also assume that not nobody died. But yeah, that's a good point. Any other questions? Let me just make very clear what these, uh, the point that some of these students just made just now. So, uh, we're defining the equilibrium in terms of little k and little y. And of course we could define these as k divided by al and y divided by al, okay? So suppose that lots of capital were, was destroyed but a proportional amount of uh, people were also killed. If so, this little k actually could remain at exactly the same level. So we actually could have never moved from steady state at all, if uh, if that happens, okay. In which case, there is no change in the growth rate. Another question. Okay. If we would assume that the entire capital is lost, then we would never get back to steady state since our steady states would be zero, right? Since we don't have production without capital. So that's actually a, a really good point, and um, and I would, I mean, the way I would say it is more that you'd be at a different steady state. So there's actually two steady states in these models. Remember the steady state is where the investment curve intersects with the breakeven curve, right? So these two intersect here. They also intersect in one other place. They intersect right here at zero, okay? So if, um, if all of the capital is destroyed, all of it, then you are in a new steady state. And it's what they call unstable steady state, because if you even have one toothpick of capital, you'll eventually converge to this steady state. But if you literally have zero capital, you have nothing, then you will remain here forever. Okay, cool, good discussion. Let's uh, get rid of that stuff. Okay, all else equal, all else equal. Which country should grow faster, a rich country or a poor country? This one I think you could maybe debate. Yeah, exactly. So you, you see here that I use this weasel word, all else equal. So we're assuming what, what is equal here. We're assuming that technology is growing at the same rate. We're assuming the population is growing at the same rate. We're assuming uh, everything is the same except for one country has less, say, capital stock than the other country. Um, and correspondingly less output per uh, unit of human capital. Um, so then the poor country is going to grow faster, right? They're going to start farther to the left on our, on our curve. Okay, one last question. Nope, nope, two, sorry, we have two more questions. According to these models, should growth in Germany be faster before World War II or after World War II? Yeah, and um, you know, of course we have here the idea. So the idea behind this question is that there's this massive bombing of, of German industry during World War II. Um, so their sort of productive capital stock was greatly reduced. Of course, a lot of Germans were killed as well, but not nearly as many as the, uh, as you know, the German industry was really reduced to very, very little, I think, at the end of World War II. So uh, you would expect that they grow faster after World War II. And in fact, I believe they did actually grow faster after World War II, starting from a lower level. Okay, last one. It took China two decades to become middle income. 
According to these models, why? Yeah, so I mean, I, 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 um, I sort of spiked it a bit by saying according to these models, but I think this is actually true, in fact. So I can see that um, some people wrote access to ideas, some people wrote trade openness. You know, those are also important reasons, I think, for China's growth uh, over the last 30, 40 years now, 40 years, wow. Um, but, you know, from the very beginning, like very quickly after the Chinese economy opens in say the late 80s and early 90s, um, you know, they had access to the ideas like the technologies in other countries, you know, there were Chinese delegations going here and there and, you know, outside of sort of patented technology, you know, there's a lot of sort of, it was, it would, the access was open from the beginning and trade openness again, you know, this happened somewhat gradually in the sense that the China only joined the WTO in like the early 2000s, but, you know, to a large degree, they were open pretty quickly at the very beginning. So the question is, why does it take such a long time to go from, uh, you know, where China started in terms of uh, output per worker, say, to where they are now? Um, the reason is that it takes time to build up the literal physical capital. Um, and, uh, you know, if I look at sort of what happened in China from the 1980s until, say, the 2000s, I think that you did have this massive uh, investments uh, which is exactly the, you know, the interest rates were very high. There was lots of savings. There was lots of building um, exactly because they needed to build up this capital stock to match the, the, um, the new economic opportunities they had. Anybody want to talk about that? So, you know, one, one sort of message of these models is sort of a negative message, right? So one negative message is if we want to have growth in the long run, by the way, I see that I need to give you guys a break, but this is the last slide, so you'll have one after. Um, one message is that long run growth is not caused by capital accumulation. Okay, we can do that in the solo model with an exogenous savings rate. We can do that in the Ramsey model with an endogenous savings rate. Um, in the long run, it's only technological development that's going to actually lead to growth. Okay, um, but you know how long is the long run? Okay, so you know it could be that you could have a very sustained amount of growth for many many years, forty years, thirty years in China, say of of spectacular growth rates um, on the way to the technological front, uh, on the way to sort of the capital steady state capital level. So um, you know this doesn't. These models don't negate that capital can be an important determinant or important uh, uh, machine, an engine of growth. It's just that not in the very long run, like not on the technological frontier. So let's see who won. Although I think it was uh, Ike. XZ. Leroy Jenkins. It's, I'm very honored that you wrote Jenkins with an I. I think the original Leroy Jenkins was with an E, but uh, you know I'm, I'm very happy to be associated with Leroy. So anyhow, let's take a 10-minute uh, break, and then we'll come back and talk about the problem. Oh no, we'll do questions and answers first for the Ramsey growth model.
Okay, we are back. Um, so next thing I'll do, let me pull up my slides here. Should have that while we were on break. One second. Let's see here, Ramsey. Okay, here are the slides. So ask away, any questions about the, uh, the lectures online? It was quite a long lecture. As you saw, I had nine different segments of it. I tried to do 10 minutes around per video. I think Marco has a question in the chat. Yes, I have written a question. Okay, um, hold on. All right, so the question is, explain why in the Ramsey model is not possible to reach the golden rule level of capital market, but K converges to a value below the golden rule level, to a value below the value which maximizes consumption. Okay, so first of all, that fact is true. So the Ramsey model, you're always below the golden rule level of output. Now as to why it's true, I can't actually remember. So I might have to get back to you, but let me just quick flip open the textbook. I called ahead a discussion about it. Let's see here. <clears throat> If there's like an immediate answer here, then I'll talk about it. But if not, I might have to get back to you. Alrighty. Dynamic phase diagram. Welfare. <clears throat> okay, so um so there's certainly a section about it in the textbook. So if you um if you have the textbook, you're looking at chapter two in uh, yes. two point. I have read uh, this uh, section, but uh, it's still not very clear to me, so I asked. Okay, um, let's see here. <clears throat> ah. Oh yeah, that actually totally makes sense. Um, okay, <clears throat> so here's the intuition. And it's pretty straightforward. Um, so, uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully I've got it. So, um, so here's the idea. Um, if, uh, if in this period, like in one particular period, if a household decides to save less, then it's going to be able to consume more. Okay. So now imagine that we're, we're at a savings, we're at an equal, imagine counterfactually, that we're in the Ramsey growth model and we're in a steady state equilibrium where our savings rate is above the golden rule level of savings, okay? I can increase that household's, I can increase the representative household's consumption in this period by reducing their savings rate. And um, in every period afterwards as well, because when we get to the new steady state, we're gonna have a higher level of consumption. So along the whole path, we're actually getting more consumption every single period. Does that make sense? So, I mean, the, the intuition is that, you know, we can never have sort of inefficiently too much saving because households can just reduce their savings levels, increase their consumption all the way to the new steady state that has higher consumption. Hey, thank you. Thank you. No worries. There's Uh, I have a question as well. Um, in the functional form of the consumption uh, maximization problem for the consumers, uh, there is like this social discount rate um, to discount all of future consumption. And I don't know if like it's a necessary mathematical feature that it's like strictly larger than zero, but as far as I understand it, it's almost always assumed to be not zero. Um, but I read somewhere so like that's pro, right? Yeah. I read somewhere that like Ramsey himself said that it would be 
oh, what was the wording? It was something like morally indefensible or something like that to have it be not negative or like be positive. Um, where, where did you where did you read it? I, uh, it's like in an other textbook. I can't remember exactly where, but I read somewhere that like you know uh, that in a moral moral case, having a value of rho that was not zero would be saying that all of you know the future generations are gonna be essentially because it's exponential discounting, right? That there would be exponentially less worth uh, further into the future, and that would be you know bad in general. Do do we have such ethical or like, you know, not strictly mathematical considerations when we formulate our models, or do we just make what, what we believe is like the most realistic to depict what uh, people actually do? Okay, so that's a very, very interesting point and uh, certainly something worth talking about. So, um, where to start? So, um, I think that so just to kind of restate the question or reframe the question, um, in, uh, in most of the models we're gonna look at and all of the models we're gonna look at, um, there's gonna be some discounting of the future, okay? So um, it means that people are going to prefer consumption today over consumption tomorrow, right? And um, is that important in these models? Um, yes, it is very important. So in fact, you'll see down here, we have a condition that we assume that this beta is greater than zero. And you can see that beta involves rho. So basically we're saying people have to be impatient enough. And I think I talked about this a bit in the video, but um, the reason why is because we want to prevent people from just sort of realizing, you know, if they, if they value the future as much as they value today, then you know, I can get a lot more consumption in the future by just uh, saving, you know, I get a return on my savings, right? So if I just never consume until a period in the distant future, I can actually consume much more. Okay, so there's a technical reason why we want to have this assumption. Okay, let's go back to the slide with utility function. Why we want to have rho greater than zero, why we want people to discount the future. Um, there's also a normative, uh, not a normative, a positive reason for this. So it turns out that when people make decisions, they act as though they discount the future. So people do prefer to get things today rather than tomorrow. And uh, if, and I think I might've talked about this in the lectures too, but you know, if there's something that we need to do that's unpleasant, we procrastinate, right? We put it off. You know, we're still gonna have to do that. It's, it's like, you know, I have to do a assignment. So suppose I've got like a, 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 a macro problems that I need to do. You know, I could do it as soon as the teacher puts it out, you know, on the same day, or I could just wait until very close to the deadline and do it. And many people will try to wait as long as possible to do it. So, you know, their behavior for better or worse is being described in some ways by uh, discounting of the future. So from a positive point of view, it sort of makes sense to include this sort of assumption. So if we want to describe the way that the world works, okay. Now, um, you know, economics, these models are used both as positive descriptions of the economy and sometimes also as normative descriptions in the sense of what should we do? What is best? What would the best society look like? Okay. Um, in that case, uh, if what we're trying to do is maximize something like utility, then um, this row now has this normative uh, flavor to it. It says that we care more about people today than we care about people tomorrow, okay? And um, whether that's defensible or not is a uh, interesting question. Many moral philosophers feel that it's not defensible. So they feel that you should actually have a row here that is zero. Um, and in fact, there's a set of uh, philosophers that are total utilitarians uh, in terms of thinking that what should be done is the thing that maximizes you, okay? That maximizes utility, welfare, whatever you think is good. Um, and in that case, uh, you can get some very crazy uh, 
um, implications. So one might be something like, um, since human beings, if we make the right decisions today, might live for billions of years into the future. So we're just at the beginning of the potential length of uh, human of human existence. If if I'm a total utilitarian, I might think that really what the most important thing that we should do is to try to make sure we don't do anything that's going to prevent that massive number of future people from existing. So for instance, maybe we should all be making very dramatic sacrifices in terms of how we spend our lives so that we can prevent things like nuclear war or, um, or uh, you know, AI from destroying people in the future or something like that. You know, these, uh, these possibilities are, they have very low probability. Even climate change, the climate change may be very costly. The chance that it actually, you know, kills everyone to end the human race is somewhat low. Um, so, you know, the idea is just that that would be so bad because of all the people in the future that would not, never exist that um, it would be worth it for us to spend almost all of our energy to try to reduce very low risks to existential risks to almost nothing. So you can see I'm going on, I can riff on this for a long time, but it's a very interesting question. Now, before I uh, get on another topic, one thing that we've done here when we've done this model is we've, we've built in a way for these households to care about themselves, okay? So we don't need to, as sort of the planners or the philosophers that are looking at this economy, we don't need to make a normative statement about what is good or what is bad. Um, what we need to assume is what these households, these dynasties themselves think is good or bad. Okay. So then, you know, from that perspective, uh, you know, even if we think about this as normative in the sense that this is what these households care about then, um, then you know, that's like a slightly different way of thinking about this as well. You see what I'm saying? One is like we, the planner, who are the total utilitarians and understand that there's no ethical reason that rho should be different than zero. Um, you know, even we might actually just say, well, we might know that, but households feel that rho should be positive. And then this gives you a way to think about the way that households feel about themselves or something like that. So that's a, a very interesting topic and it's the edge of philosophy and uh, economics actually, of moral philosophy and economics. And uh, if you're interested in more, there's, um, I actually read a paper a few months ago, I think where somebody had a survey, it was a philosopher though, so it was very negative on economics, but she had a survey about this row and how we can think about it. So there you go. Um, to add to the question then in a different way, but also it sounds like an interesting paper. Um, has there been a variant of the Ramsey model that doesn't rely on an infinite time horizon? Because I guess that that would make like the mathematical limitations easier because you wouldn't have to discount it heavily in order to uh, have like a finite amount of utility. Yeah, so I mean, it depends how long you want to make it, right? So um, you're not wrong. But uh, once you make the model very, very long, um, you know, as long as there's sort of enough time, things are going to get weird when you get close to the end of history or something like that. But, um, but as long as you're far away from the end of history, I don't think it would make that much difference. You're right that there might be some technical advantage to that. The point of the model isn't the point of this model isn't necessarily to make a normative point, right? The point of this model is to make a positive point what drives economic growth in the long run. So we don't need to have a normative um, interpretation. Uh, could you explain on slide 20 how this difference between the rental rate of capital and the sort of discount rate in flex. Could you go through that one more time? Yeah, do you want to, do you want to, are you interested in the derivation of this equation or are you interested in the interpretation of it? In the interpretation. Okay, that's easier. 
So um, <laughs> this is a, a very annoying equation to derive, I think. But um, what this says is um, sort of the change in the level of consumption in the economy at any time is going to be a function of uh, the difference between how impatient people are. So, you know, all else equal, if people are very impatient, then consumption in the future is going down. Why is that? Because, you know, I'm consuming now, right? My consumption tomorrow is gonna to be low. I'm consuming a lot now. I'm, I, I don't care about people in the future. So, um, so if rho is high, then we would expect this thing to go down. On the other hand, there's a countervailing force. That's this rate of return. So, you know, if I get a big return for my savings, if I give up a little bit of consumption today, then tomorrow I get more consumption. So it's like, you know, the higher is the rate of return or the interest rate, the uh, better deal it is for me to delay consumption to tomorrow. Okay. So um, if, and if I'm delaying consumption to tomorrow, then my consumption is increasing, right? It's even more tomorrow. So there's this battle here between the interest rate and the rate of impatience or the discount rate. Okay. And then why does this theta appear here? This theta, one over theta is the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. So, and not theta, but one over theta, right? So if one over theta is very high, then it means that I don't really care when my consumption happens. It's just as good for me to consume tomorrow as it is today. If so, then this effect is gonna be really big because it's like, you know, if I'm impatient, I'll move all of my consumption to today. On the other hand, if the savings rate is, is really, or if the, uh, excuse me, the interest rate is really high, then, hey, I don't care whether the consumption is today or tomorrow. I want to move everything to my, everything to tomorrow. Okay. So when, when there's a high uh, elasticity of intertemporal substitution, then the effect of these guys is bigger. On the other hand, if this thing is really low, it's like, I just want to have the same amount of consumption every day. So I don't really care what the interest rate is relative to how impatient I am. Okay. So that's my explanation. Thank you. I was gonna set the, uh, the timer for 20 minutes, but then I forgot to or the question and answers. Anybody have any other questions? Okay, there's one last little point I wanna make about this um, model. Uh, and then let's turn to the problem set. So this is just kind of a general point. Let's see here. I don't know, there's a natural, there's no place, natural place to stop. So I'll just go to the first slide. Um, so just like in the solar growth, growth model, we see in the Ramsey growth model or neoclassical growth model that the long run rate of, of growth in terms of output per worker is gonna be given by the rate of technological progress, which we assume is exogenous. Now, as I mentioned, we are going to look at a model where the, the rate of technological progress is not exogenous. It's something that sort of comes out of the equilibrium of the model. Um, not next session, but I believe the session after that. Um, but I think that is an interesting point to make here about GA. I can't write it. but. Um, I sometimes think when I'm reading media articles or um, just kind of listening to people talk about, say, technological progress or improvement or growth, um, it's kind of taken to be as it is in these models. So maybe it's because people actually have these models in the back of their mind, but they think of it as something exogenous, like, you know, there's nothing we can do about it. It just, is what it is. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, they'll say things like, uh, you know, artificial or automation or artificial intelligence is coming. 
you know, it's going to happen or, you know, whatever the, uh, you know, in, in 15 years, we'll have self-driving cars. It's just going to happen. But it, it's almost like this weird sort of like determinism that there's nothing that could be done to stop this change that is outside of our control as society. Um, but, you know, that's not true, right? I mean, it's not like technology or whatever, you know, the rate of innovation is just something that happens outside of society that, that nothing can be done about, um, you know. So I, that, I just want to point that out. And, uh, you know, you can look for that when you're, when you're listening to people talk about this sort of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, that's the way it's being treated here in these models. It's like something that's just outside of anything else in society. It just kind of happens and there's nothing that can be done about it. So that was the point I wanted to make. Okay. So the very last thing I want to do today is just talk a little bit about the problem set. So I have made solutions for the first part. So um, uh, I only have here up to like, the, I asked a bunch of questions and then there were a couple questions from the solo growth model. Um, so I think I'll take those during our next, uh, our next exercise session. Um, but today we're just gonna go over these guys. Let me make it bigger so you can read what's happening on the screen. Okay. So I think I'll just kind of read through these answers and then um, if you have questions, just stop me. So uh, the first one is about Robinson Crusoe, typical economics example of Robinson Crusoe. Uh, he's shipwrecked on a tropical island. He's the only person on the island. Okay. So the only production on the island is what Robinson Crusoe produces. Uh, the only consumption on the island is what Robin, Robinson Crusoe consumes. Okay, so the question is, is it possible for Robin Crusoe to invest? Okay, what would that look like? Now, the answer I wrote is that, yes, investment looks like Robinson spending less time fishing and building a garden fence to make his garden yield more in the future or something like that. You could think of a thousand examples. But the point is to try to make this investment not financial investment, not investing in a stock or a bond, right? Robinson Crusoe can't buy a stock. Um, but he can invest in this sort of macroeconomic sense of delaying consumption to make himself more productive in the future. Okay, so that's that. Okay, next one. Take a large economy with a single factor of production labor. Workers are paid an hourly wage rate and we'll assume that everyone works full-time regardless of the wage level. Suppose that due to a personal demand shock, you want to consume a little less this period and a little more next period. You, you decide to save some of your money today and spend it tomorrow. In terms of resources, what happens? Okay. Uh, so what I write is the price of consumption goes down a bit today since you are consuming a little bit less or everything else is equal and other people are gonna then consume a little bit more. Tomorrow, the price of consumption is gonna go up a little bit since you wanna consume a little bit more um, and that's gonna cause everybody else to consume a bit less. In terms of the production, I guess I didn't write this, but in terms of the production, since we've assumed that people are gonna work regardless of the wages and anything else, basically, um, the same amount of stuff is produced. It's the same size of pie, okay? All that's happening is that the prices are gonna adjust so that the split is a little bit different in the, in the two days. In day two, I'm gonna consume a bit more. Everybody else is gonna consume a bit less. They want, I'm going to consume a little bit less. Everybody else is going to consume a bit more. Okay. Part B, due to an economy-wide demand shock, everybody wants to consume a little bit less this period and a little bit more next period. They all decide to save some of their money today and spend it tomorrow. In terms of resources, what happens? Nothing. So why does nothing happen? Nothing happens because the amount that's produced and consumed every day is fixed. The amount of labor that's you know, there to produce it is exogenous. It doesn't have anything to do with the wage rate or the prices. So, um, so by assumption. So it means that if, if everybody wants to consume more, they can't consume more on day one because, uh, because no more can be produced. Okay. 
And then on day two, if they all want to consume a little bit less or whatever, then, you know, they can't all consume less. I mean, I guess they could all consume less, but um, then they would just be wasting some of the production. There's no way to change the size of the pie, only its distribution is the idea. Um, next one, suppose the economy had- So one question regarding that. Go ahead. Would it be possible to change the savings rate and so consume more this period? But how are you going to consume more? Only the same amount is produced. Yeah, but we invest less for future periods. What so invest? We could take some of the investment, couldn't we? What do you mean by invest? I mean, isn't investment like investing into capital stocks, so building machines, etc.? Yeah, but there's only one factor, labor. There's no yeah, Okay, true, true. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I don't know if I asked it in this, in this uh, set of questions, but, um, but, you know, what is really the difference between capital and labor in, in this class of models? You know, could we just call it labor? It could be, you know, you and I, we know what we mean by labor, people out in the workforce working, but, you know, these are, this is just math, right? So at like a pure level of abstraction, what's the difference between labor and capital in these models? Really, the difference is that labor just disappears every period. Either you use it or it, it's gone. Okay. So, um, so capital, on the other hand, is something that persists across periods. So you can sort of think about capital as a way of moving sort of things like, you know, real consumption and production from one period to another. So, you know, by being very tricky here, I've sort of assumed that away. We only have this labor that just disappears if you don't use it. So um, there really is no way for society to save until part C, where I say, um, where I say that suppose we had two factors of production, capital and labor, now can we say all save money? Yeah, we actually can, right? Just by the same argument that this uh, student just now, I didn't, sorry, I didn't see your name, was, um, was, uh, was suggesting, which is we can, delay our consumption, invest in capital, and then the next day become more productive and all consume more. Okay, but you need that extra factor. Okay. Moving on. It is apple season. Uh, apples have all been harvested. At current prices, everyone in Denmark is expected to buy a bag of 10 apples. Suddenly, an apple craze hits Denmark and everybody would like to buy twice as many apples at the current prices. How many apples does everyone end up with? Well, it's a bag of 10 apples, okay? And the reason why is because you can't get, you know, under some assumptions, right? It's a closed economy, right? You can't import apples, I guess. Um, there's only so many apples. We can't, it takes like, you know, whatever, a year to grow an apple from an apple tree. You can't get more apples, even if everybody would like to consume more apples. So what's really gonna happen here is that the price of apples is just gonna go up and people are gonna end up consuming the same as they consumed before. Uh, so again, it's sort of a price adjustment, supply demand type argument here. You, you see that you know, related to our discussion earlier, I'm very, I'm relying very heavily on this uh, sort of new classical understanding of the economy, since that's really my training, right? So, I mean, I think Keynes would say here, you know, he, he would, I mean, maybe in this particular example with apples, you can't just produce more apples. You know, he would say there's slack in the economy. There's people that aren't working that could be working. There's capital out there, machines and buildings that could be employed for production that aren't. So if, um, you know, if people demand more, then more will be produced, right? So, I mean, this is actually the way I'm laying this out is really taking a, a side here in that debate. I'm just mentioning that. Okay, continuing on the same, along the same lines. Suppose that you found out you were gonna die next month being a bit de devious, you go to the bank, take out a big loan against your future income. The bank doesn't know that you don't have any um, and go on a big splurge. In terms of resources, what happens today and tomorrow? Well, it's kind of the same idea as in the, uh, I think it was problem two. Okay, so um, 
you're going to consume a larger fraction of output in the near term. Um, in the long term, you would promise to pay back these people, right? By giving some of quote your production to the people, to your uh, creditors, but they didn't know that you're actually not going to be there. So production goes down and uh, aggregate consumption in the economy will just have to fall a little bit. Okay. So output in the near term doesn't change because you're producing, everybody else is producing. Uh, in the next period, you're not there anymore. So output goes down. Um, so you got a bigger share of the same size of pie in the first period. And in the second period, the size of the pie gets smaller. Okay, and just like in question two, we're gonna contrast sort of question four with question five here. Suppose you found out that the world is gonna end next month. Can humanity just borrow all of their future income and splurge this month? Why or why not? I think you could answer this in either way. Um, so I write sort of here. So in a sense, uh, the resources that were gonna be used for investment could be used for consumption, right? We don't have to worry about production tomorrow any longer. So to the extent that you can, you know, um, not invest in the maintenance of your house, right? I mean, you don't have to spend time keeping up your house. It's gonna be destroyed tomorrow anyway. Um, you know, you can divert those resources to something productive for consumption potentially. Um, so I can see how in that sense you could, but kind of when I wrote the question, the point was kind of that you can't, borrow against future consumption because there's nobody who you can pay back. You know, ultimately you need to pay people back in terms of real, uh, real output, but tomorrow there is no real output. So there's, there's no interest rate at which anybody would want to loan you money. Um, that's the idea. Okay, so the next one actually involves a little math and I see that I didn't do it here, so I'll have to sketch it out. I'm gonna to try to actually, maybe I'll do that one at the very end. It'll be the last thing we do before I let you go for the day. But um, anyway, uh, yeah, let me skip number six and we'll come back because this one will have to do a little calculation. Okay, number seven, suppose the government were to raise income taxes and then use the proceeds as basic income, like universal basic income. That is, they'd be remitted evenly to all Danes. Let's suppose it's in Denmark. How would this affect the total amount of consumption in Denmark? How would it affect the distribution of consumption? Okay. So the idea here is that if you raise income taxes, then typically the thing that you're taxing, people are going to do less of it. So here it's working. So you would expect that in the short term, at least in the short term, at least production and aggregate consumption have to fall. So the size of the pie has to get smaller, okay? But the distribution would skew toward the poor, right? So, um, so you're both gonna change the size of the pie, it's gonna get smaller, but then the distribution is going to change so that it's more even, or it's gonna be a, a redistribution from richer people to poorer people. Um, this sort of idea, sometimes people call it the leaky bucket uh, model of government transfers. So whenever you take something from one person in society and give it to somebody else, then the amount that you can give is less than what was originally there. So uh, the idea is that any tax is going to sort of cause there to be less of a certain type of production potentially. Um, so yeah, so that's that one. Doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It just means that that's how we'd expect it to work out. All right, suppose that automation continues and by 2050 robots can do everything better and more efficiently than people. Is this a dystopian future? Why or why not? This is a fun one to think about, I think. Um, so whether it's dystopian or not depends on how the output is distributed and a little bit more that I'll mention in a second. So most people, they get a certain amount of labor each period, they sell it. Um, if the automation is like the way that I've described it here, then their labor is no longer valuable, okay? So they own nothing of value, right? So many, if you don't own any capital, what you sell is your labor. And if you don't have any labor, then you have nothing that the market, not that you don't have anything valuable. I mean, not that you yourself are not, don't have value, but the market here isn't valuing your labor. 
Okay. Um, in that case, the market by itself is not going to allocate anything to people. Okay. So suppose then that the government policy is to distribute output widely. Okay. So first of all, that sounds really bad. That means people that don't own capital are going to have nothing from the market. So if the government were to, you know, we government of course is us, if we weren't the sort of redistribute, that would be a very dystopian scenario where you have some people starving in the streets and then others that own the robots being very rich. Um, on the other hand, suppose that the government redistributes the wealth very widely, then, you know, robots do everything more efficiently than people. That means that the size of the pie is bigger and now nobody has to work, right? So that doesn't sound like a dystopian scenario. So it depends a little bit on what you assume is going to happen with uh, redistribution. It's, I always think, you know, it, if you're having a hard day at work, it's hard to, it's hard to think about how robots doing everything better is such a bad thing because then you don't have to do the drudgery of, of work. Um, now, the other little bit I want to add to that's not in this answer is if you take a walk through the cemetery near Fredericksburg Park, I'm pointing because that's where it is from where I'm sitting, um, then, or any of the older cemeteries in Copenhagen. So uh, if you look right up to say about 1940, I would say, um, it's pretty standard that on the gravestones, they write, you know, they write the person's name, they write the dates that this person lived, um, and what's the other information that they think is like a critical part of who this person is? It's their profession, right? So you'll see things like, you know, slaughter, they're like a butcher, or they'll be like a doctor, or they'll be a nurse, or they'll be a typist, um, you know, a machine worker. But, uh, you know, people, that's part of their identity. And, you know, part of but I think that something that many people get value from in their life is thinking about how they contribute somehow to, you know, society, right? You know, we want to be, we want to contribute somehow. And I think that at least currently, many people think about their contribution as happening through their work. You know, they do this thing that other people value. So, um, you know, if robots do everything, I mean, there's a philosopher at Harvard named Michael Sandel, Sandel, who's sort of skeptical of markets. And he says that, you know, this is kind of like a bribe to pay people and say, you're not really, you know, you can't really provide anything valuable to society anymore. So here's a payout, you know, go live your life, you know. <laughs> so it doesn't sound very nice when you put it that way. So, you know, there's, there's other considerations here as well. Okay, uh, last one, uh, before I go back and do number seven. Uh, discuss briefly from the resource perspective, the following policies, what happens to actual production and consumption, reduction of the hours in the work week, but with the same weekly pay for everybody. We talked about this one a bit already, so I'll just say real wages must fall since there's less production. Real wages must fall, unless people become so efficient, but I just find that very hard to believe. Uh, if, if people can become so much more productive through the shorter work week that they actually produce more working less hours because they're less stressed or something, then you could turn this result around. But I find that situation unlikely. Um, anyway, B, the official retirement age is raised one year. Well, more is produced, right? The aggregate economy grows because we have one more year, one more cohort of workers working. Uh, so aggregate consumption, or I should say investment or consumption rises. Uh, aggregate output rises. Um, leisure of those that have that would have retired falls. So they themselves, that one cohort, is is probably worse off if you consider work something that they don't. You know, I've got some uh, relatives that are close to retirement and they're looking forward to it. So um, you could think about this as sort of redistribution. Okay. Trade surplus in Denmark falls. Part C. Production doesn't change, right? But Danes consume more in the short run. So recall that this is this perspective where the production is based on the amount of factors of productions you have in your economy. So uh, if the trade surf surplus changes, that doesn't change the factors of production. Output is the same. It's just that now we're not shipping so much of it out. 
some of it that we're shipping out, it, we're maybe consuming instead or investing instead. Okay. Any questions about these before I move on to that very last one? Okay, so this one, it says uh, number six, the last thing we'll do today. So um, there's a perennial idea associated with libertarianism that tax revenues may sometimes be raised by reducing the tax rate. Anybody know what that's called, by the way? There's a curve associated with that. Anybody know that curve's name? Laffer. The Laffer curve, the famous Laffer curve from uh, Apparently, an economist named Art Laffer wrote it on a napkin, drew it on a napkin at a dinner with President Nixon in the, like 1971. It has since been called the Laffer curve. But yeah, so the idea is that, um, is that well, I think we can just do this, solve the problem, okay? So suppose that labor is the only factor of production. Preferences are as follows, okay? so. Um, L here uh, is the fraction of time that is devoted to labor. Okay. C is consumption. And then let's say there's a budget constraint that looks like this. Okay. So um, tax revenue, it's an income tax. Okay. So it's wage times labor times the tax rate tau divided by P. Okay. So um, let's figure out how raising the taxes is going to affect tax revenue. So um, I wrote out the beginning of the question here. Maybe I can just keep writing here. Okay, so here's the setup. So this is the budget constraint. Okay, and I'm going to divide both sides by P. And then I'm going to substitute out consumption in the utility function. Okay. And then I'm going to think, is this the right way to do it? What is the labor choice that people are going to do uh, Yeah, what is the optimal labor choice? Let's do that first, okay? So you can see now we have this utility function. It's based uh, the only choice here, if you substitute out C, the only choice is L. okay? So all we have to do is take the derivative of this thing with respect to L. And that should tell us the uh, worker's optimal choice of labor as a share of time. By the way, I didn't, hopefully this all works out correctly. So um, let's take the derivative here. We're gonna get sigma divided by sigma minus one okay, times this whole thing here. I'm just gonna call quotation mark inside this thing uh, to the power sigma divided by sigma minus one minus one. Okay. Then I have to take its product rule. So I have to take the derivative of the inside. Okay. So we're going to have sigma minus one divided by sigma times w divided by p l one minus tau the power sigma minus one divided by sigma minus one. It's going to be negative one over sigma. Okay, and then we still have what's inside here. So that's going to be one minus tau times w divided by p. One minus tau times w divided by p. Okay. So that was quite a long thing there. Now we still have to add a term, add that second term, this one now. Sigma minus one divided by sigma. And then uh, one minus L to the power negative one divided by sigma. And then just negative one, right? So we're gonna just put a negative sign somewhere. I'll just say negative one here. Okay. Set this thing equal to zero, and then we have to solve for L. So let's see how much we can cancel out here. Well, you can see that these guys cancel. 
this thing is multiplied on the outside of this expression. We can divide both sides by this thing. So it's not zero. So that goes away. Um, we have powers of negative. Uh, we have these powers that are the same. Uh, okay, let's add it one more step here. So now I've just canceled these things out. Um, let's put this part on the right-hand side and keep this on the left-hand side. So we're going to get W divided by P L one minus tau to the power negative one over sigma is equal to one minus L negative one over sigma. That's it. Oh, I missed a, I missed this term here. This is still here. One minus tau W divided by P. Okay. Now let's raise both sides to the power of negative sigma. So we're going to get P divided by one minus tau W to the power sigma W divided by P L one minus tau is equal to one minus L. Okay, this looks good. So now we can solve for L. Oof. Let's see here. Um, how to keep this as clean as possible. Um, so you can see that we we have something here. Okay, so we have here p divided by w times one minus tau. Here we have w divided by p times one minus tau. So actually we can combine these into something. We can have w divided by p times one minus tau to the power of one minus sigma. So let's do that. That'll make our lives a little easier. w divided by p, here we got one minus tau, all to the power one minus sigma times l is equal to one. This is much easier, isn't it? Okay, perfect. Now you can see what we're gonna do. We're going to add L to both sides and then divide. So we're going to get L star now is equal to one divided by one plus W one minus tau divided by P to the power one minus sigma. All right. I can see I'm almost done here. Let me just erase that a little bit there. It's just that I want to I want to correct one more thing. We've assumed that sigma. Oh, we didn't actually make it. We didn't make an assumption on sigma, did we? So um, typically, people assume that the sigma is greater than one, which means that um, that consumption and leisure are substitutes in the utility function. So just to make my life easier, let me um let me do that. So I'm just going to flip the sign of that. Not change anything else. Okay, so we're going to get L star is equal to one divided by one plus P divided by W one minus tau to the power of sigma minus one. Okay, so. Um, Are we done? Do we need to do more? So what the question was is if we raise the tax rate, then how is that going to affect revenues? Okay, tax revenues, as you recall from the problem are equal to W times L times tau divided by P Okay, so what we need to know is um, if we increase tau, will we increase this expression? Okay. So let's, for the moment, let's assume that the sigma is greater than one so that consumption and leisure are substitutes. All right. 
So if tau goes up, that means that this thing down here gets smaller, which means that this whole term gets bigger, which means that the labor supply is going to fall, okay? Suppose now, suppose for a second that, um, that sigma were less than one, okay? In that case, you get the opposite. So then, then what happens is if you raise the um, taxes, then labor supply is actually gonna rise and then un unambiguously revenues are gonna rise. Okay, so if, if leisure and, and consumption were complements, then you're gonna get more tax revenues by raising taxes. Um, if sigma is greater than one, then you have to, then I think we still have to do something here. I think we have to imagine we had a tau here. So we need to figure out whether L star times tau uh, is going to increase or decrease. When we raise tau. And it could go either way because we've just determined that L star is going down and tau is going up. Excuse me. No, sorry, it was somebody on Teams talking. Um, okay. So the reason I'm hesitating here to start writing more is because, um, you know, we can easily plug this L star into this expression. And then I could take the derivative with respect to tau, and then that will give me the answer. But um, I'm just thinking, is there a way to do it where it's not going to be just a ton of notation? Um, so I'm thinking. Suppose that tau is zero, then our revenues are certainly zero. Suppose that tau is one, then the labor supply is zero. Okay. And if labor supply is zero, then our revenues are certainly zero. Okay, see, so I don't have to do anything else. So the idea here is that when tau is zero, revenues are zero, obviously. The tax rate is zero, right? Um, now notice here that um, if sigma is greater than one, then as we raise tau without uh, any ambiguity, L star is gonna go down, okay? So, um, and in fact, when tau is equal to one, you can see here that um, you know, this term is gonna go to infinity, which means that this denominator here is gonna be infinite and L star is gonna be zero. If L star is zero, revenues are zero, okay? So when we raise taxes, does the, um, does the amount of revenues go up or down? Well, it depends. It depends how high taxes are. So what this argument I've just said, uh, gone through does, is it says that we know that revenues are zero, this is revenues, when taxes are one, I should have put one here. We know that revenues are zero when taxes are zero, and we know that revenues are positive somewhere in the middle. So, um, so however you draw this curve, you can make it squiggly if you want, but whether or not taxes are gonna go up or down, uh, it depends on what the level of taxes are. So there is actually a Laffer curve here, okay? There must be because of this argument I just gave you, okay? So I don't think I need to do anything else. I think that's kind of the answer to the, the question. When we raise taxes, um, do revenues go up or down? 
Well, it depends. It depends on how high the level of taxes are. Okay. So most of that was just figuring out what this L star is and then doing a bit of reasoning. Now, before I flip away from the calculation, um, does anybody want to ask me questions about this before I read what was on the uh, answer on the PDF? Would we be asked to do something like this in the exam? Is that too much? Oh, the 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 most typical, the most uh, the most common question. If I had to rank them, uh, that I've uh, um, I've ever got, will you be asked to do this on the exam? Yes, you could be asked. This one in particular, I don't know, but um, this sort of taking the derivative of something, uh, yeah, you could be asked to do that. Is that unusual for you guys? I mean, is it the issue with the notation or, but I mean, you know, just generally to say solve, if I gave you say a utility function and a budget constraint and said solve for the optimal amount of consumption or the optimal amount of leisure. Uh, yeah, that's something that I think I could ask you to do on an exam. So, I mean, I'm not sure if you've seen my past exams, I probably should post one soon, but typically I have sort of short answer section where I ask you questions that are almost Kahoot like about the models. And then I have a technical section where I ask you to sort of derive something or solve a model. And in that technical section, yeah, I think something like this could appear. Um, but as far as I understand, you guys have a decent technical background. So tell me if I'm, stop me if I'm wrong here, but that's how I understand it. You guys are like the uh, considered, I think at one time when this program was started, this was supposed to be like the feeder program for the PhD uh, in econ and finance at CBS. So yeah, um, any other questions? I wouldn't give this, I wouldn't give like, you know, such a difficult question to say um, other necessarily to other programs, like that would require this amount of solving. But yeah, I think I could ask you a question like this. Um, okay, so uh, just to flip quickly back to the uh, question six here. So I say it depends on the sigma or the elasticity of substitution as well as the level of taxes. If the elasticity of substitution is greater than one, so that leisure and consumption are substitutes, then there's a revenue maximizing tax level that's less than one. That makes sense because people will not work if the income tax is taxed at 99.9%. .9%. However, this only kicks in if taxes are very high. Okay. And then, as I said, it's not here in the answer, but if sigma is less than one, then actually um, it's unambiguous that when you increase the tax rate, you're going to increase revenues. Any other questions? You guys are the few and the proud. It looks like, let's see here. 23 of you made it to the end. Okay, um, so that is it for today. So next week, um, you're going to, we're going to talk about the overlapping generations model and related to what I said today, just to give you a little preview. So um, we had a very particular way that household that we thought about sort of welfare in this model. We had these households that sort of care about their dynasties forever with this positive discount rate. Um, we're going to have the opposite assumption in the next class. So we're going to have basically people that live for two periods and they're gonna care about themselves. So they're gonna care about themselves in the next period, but then they die and they don't care about whatever happens after they die. So there's no dynasties, there's just generations uh, and generations are totally selfish. So it's kind of the opposite of what uh, Kai was suggesting. So instead of increasing the amount we care about the future in the next model, we're going to talk about people who really don't care about the future at all. Okay. And we're going to see, and what's the point? We're going to see if that's going to one, change any conclusions about 
growth, so about capital accumulation. And then two, we're going to see that there's some interesting that dynamics can be very weird. And actually, there's situations where the government could get involved and sort of increase everyone's consumption forever. So the market, the, the market equilibrium is not always efficient. Okay. So that's the preview. And uh, I will talk to you guys next week.